You're muted, Mark. You're muted, Mark. Okay, so let's get this show on the road. A little bit of technical issues always keeps things exciting. Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will discuss organizations that combat online hate and harassment and how to make digital spaces safe with a special guest, David Siffrey, Dave Siffrey, who oversees the Anti-Defamation League Center for Technology and Society, or CTS, and Larry Magid, uh, President and CEO of ConnectSafe.org. And a reminder to Zoom attendees that we'll take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So thank you both for joining us. It's just so wonderful to, to have you. And in the, in the pre-discussion, I, I learned uh, quite a bit already, uh, Larry, in our discussion. David, I'm so looking forward to, uh, to chatting with you about this, this whole um, issue that, that we have. You know, the, the country has always suffered its share of bigotry and extremism, disinformation and such, but it's just been supercharged by, by tech. And we have all these different things. I mean, there are even terms that are difficult to understand, swatting, doxing, cyberbullying, all, all these different techniques to harass or to spread hate and disinformation. So Dave, let's, let's uh, start with you because ADL has just conducted um, an online hate and harassment survey um, uh, recently. And I know that you also did something on, on gaming, right? I mean, you, you think that gaming well, you know, everybody's having fun, but but the the statistics on that are just astounding. So, could you just sort of bring us up to date on what the ADL is doing in this area and how and what you're finding? Absolutely, Mark. And first off, thank you so much for having me uh, on the show and Larry as well. And uh, just uh, glad to be able to share a little bit about some of the work that the Anti Defamation League uh, has been doing here. Um, so. We have been uh, studying and living and fighting online hate since well before there was an internet, right? For over 30 years, ADL has been involved in this cause. Uh, and what we've seen is really troubling. So this year, uh, we did our third annual nationally representative survey on online hate and harassment. And what we found was that 41% of Americans said they had experienced online harassment. 41, 41%. 41%. And more significantly, 27%, that's over one in four, reported sustained physical sexual harassment, stalking. These we call the severe online harassment, right? So, so if that, that isn't you personally, think about it. It's one in four of your coworkers, of your friends, of your family. So this is when the latter category, is that when you're, you're actually targeted and, and it's a sustained um, uh, uh, effort to, to basically tear you down? That's exactly right. So severe online harassment is sexual harassment, stalking, physical threats, swatting, doxing, and sustained harassment. I can talk a little bit of, for those people who don't know what swatting and doxing is. Um, doxing is the the use of your or the publishing of your personal information in a way that you didn't authorize in a malicious way on the internet. So if I were to, uh, let's say I disagree with you politically, Mark, right? And so I were to publish your home address and say, gee, that Mark Oppenheim, you know, he's really wrong on this side of the issue. You should go to his house or you should go to where his kids go to school at this particular address. So that's doxing and we consider that severe harassment and swatting is actually something that's a little bit newer um, and it comes from the, uh, the abuse of police 911 systems. And this actually comes out of the world of online games primarily, but it, it actually happens uh, all over where someone often from outside the country or outside a jurisdiction calls 911 saying that, hey, this person has guns in their house or they're, you know, they're doing something terrible to someone in their house. And that prompts the call of a SWAT team to actually come to your house. And, you know, it sounds funny. It's a prank 
but it's serious. And what's happened is that, in fact, a 28-year-old father of two um, who showed up, you know, the police shows up at his house because somebody had swatted him for something that one of his kids were doing. Um, he had no idea what was going on made what looked like a threatening movement and the SWAT team shot and killed him. So, you know, this is serious. And unfortunately, the way that most laws are written today in most states is that that shows up at most as a misdemeanor filing a false police report. And so, you know, these kinds of laws just haven't been updated for what's going on on the internet today. Um, but those are even still a small minority compared to the kind of online harassment that we see going on on a regular basis where you know online people are being stalked, they're being harassed, um, and in particular in the world of online games. Let's, so, let's, let's, let's get to the online games in yeah. a second. I'd, like I'd like to bring Larry in. Larry, you have a, a phenomenal career working for a lot of different media organizations, yeah. a lot of different eras. You know, there's a lot here that isn't new. That's correct. New techniques. I mean, if you go back to what was done um, to um, to demonize different groups, um, and and you look at how newspaper media was used, if you look at um, how films were used um, in the run up to the Second World War, to mm -hmm. uh, Hitler's takeover, and so on, that was a new media as well. And and some of those techniques seem to be the same techniques, are they? To some extent. I mean, even if you look at American media, I mean, look at the way the Japanese were portrayed in America in World War II or where the Chinese have been portrayed in my childhood watching television. Uh, we certainly had uh, bigotry reflected even in, in, in mass commercial media. But I think things have changed as a result of the internet in the sense that what used to be a fringe group, I mean, I remember growing up and there were, there were extremists. We, I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles. My family was Jewish. My mom was involved in United Nations and we had, we had the Klan. We had, believe it or not, you know, in my, my youth, even in LA, we had Nazis. And uh, we, I remember when somebody painted a swastika on our driveway because of my mom's uh, political, social activity. They weren't even political. But it's certainly much different now because it's so much easier to pile on. And it's also potentially 24 seven. And it was interesting uh, looking at listening to David's statistics. I haven't had a chance to, to review that survey, but one of the things that Connect Safely has been doing for years, we actually now work for all ages. We have programs for senior citizens, uh, for toddlers, but for the most, most of our history, we focus primarily on teenagers on social media. And one of the points that we like to make is that teens are not the only ones who are engaged in or are affected by what we typically call cyberbullying, what, what David calls harassment. And in our parents' guide to cyberbullying, we point out that workplace bullying is actually worse than schoolyard bullying, at least statistically worse. And possibly, I don't know whether it's more impactful, but the point is that, that this is something that affects all generations on the internet. Young women, David mentioned sexual harassment, are particularly vulnerable. Uh, David mentioned gaming. I mean, there's this whole Gamergate phenomenon where you go into a game to have fun, to have community, to have some friendly rivalry, and all of a sudden you're attacked because of your gender or perhaps your race or for whatever reasons. And it's just so easy. And, and the, the term I like to use here is disinhibition. And the analogy that I like to use is driving. So if I'm walking through New York City, as I do often, and I accidentally bump into somebody, I'll say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll apologize. They'll say, don't worry about it. We'll move on. If I'm driving on the highway and I accidentally cut someone off, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to get a, a hand gesture and they're going to scream at me. I might not hear them. But the point is that we are in a three, each of us are in a 3,000 pound car. And psychologically, we don't seem like human beings to each other. So while in New York, if I bump into somebody in the street, I'm another person. Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm on the freeway. I'm just this entity inside of a car and I'm, I, I'm subject to this kind of verbal or whatever kind of, not abuse, but harassment. Same thing is true on the internet. We forget that the people that we're encountering on the internet are our neighbors, are our friends, are our fellow citizens. Maybe we disagree with them, but frankly, if I ran into somebody on the street who I disagreed with, chances are pretty good they're not going to harass me just because we happen to have different politics. So it's in part, it's, it's the anonymity of the internet. Yeah. And the fact that, that we can basically get away with, uh, with uncivil, uh, uncivil behavior. That's right. Um, and, and um, we can even get away with abusive behavior. And, and as you said, David, the, uh, the laws surrounding abusive behavior um, 
are no longer in proportion to the damage that that abusive um, behavior can engender. Um, so you end up um, having bad actors having much more license and much more flexibility to do damage. How do you deal with this in a free society? Because we do treasure our freedom of speech. We do uh, treasure our freedom of, of interactions. I mean, I'm not so hot on all of a sudden regulating all those, those interactions. David, what do you, how, how do you translate your findings into suggestions that make you know, American civil society better without suppressing uh, speech? Yeah, no, I, I very much agree with you, Mark. I think that uh, these are really important considerations. I think though we, we need to also take into considerations, what about the people who are being silenced? The, the folks who are in marginalized groups or who don't feel safe because all of a sudden the loudest voice is now being amplified by the algorithm, the most hateful voice, the most controversial voice. And you know this kind of abuse and harassment gets played for sport. So what the, the, the truth of the matter is that today, most of this hate and harassment and abuse is actually happening on private platforms. It's occurring on platforms like Facebook and Twitter and in you know, many of the major games. So these are all run by companies. These companies all have the right to set the rules for what they believe is acceptable and civil on their well, platforms. Anonymous and in fact- part, uh, Anonymous they, speech is also part of their, mo uh, their model because by keeping people uh, anonymous and only giving them those companies access to who is actually um, undertaking the speech, right? You can monetize that speech. So it is, it is in the interest of, of, of companies to keep themselves in that, interme uh, that mediation role, but, but they don't seem to be exercising any kind of mediation or at least not effective mediation. Yeah, I, let's not get confused by anonymity here. I mean, Facebook, which is you know, the platform where 75% of people who report being harassed say that they were harassed at least once on Facebook. Uh, you know, they have a real name policy. So their policy is that you do need to say, I'm David Siffrey, you're Mark Oppenheim, you're Larry McKitt, right? So, you know, the, the issue is not so much what is the name policy, it's really about what is the behavior that not only is condoned, but by their own algorithms, what behavior becomes amplified? What shows up at the top of your newsfeed is determined for you. It is not just what's the latest thing being said. It's tuned by these algorithms that understand that controversial speech, hateful speech, speech that you know will get you angry or get you to believe more in a particular cause is going to increase engagement. And engagement means that you're gonna stay on the site a little longer. You're gonna click on that like, you're gonna share it with your friends and that leads to advertising dollars. So, you know, a really core part of this is looking at the advertising driven business model that is behind so much of the algorithmic amplification of this kind of polarization because it works. So I, I, I think that's it. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, Dave, you know, David corrected uh, my supposition that that an anonymity was, was an issue. I was just going to ask you um, whether whether you also endorse this idea that that it's 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 a purposeful tilt um, that is that is part of the driver here. Well, I don't know anyone. Well, I, I, was, uh, I was asking. I was asking Larry. David. Well, that was the point I was about to make. It, it's actually an unintended consequence of their advertising strategy. So, for example. Uh, if you are somebody who likes shoes and you love shoes, they're going to know that and you're going to see a lot of shoe ads. And, and, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is debatable. Some would argue it's a good thing because you're seeing ads that are interesting to you as opposed to ads for something you don't care about. Uh, but the bottom line is it's, it's certainly good for the shoe companies. It's certainly good for Facebook and may or may not be annoying to you. But if you're somebody who likes, let's say, um, you're, you're, you're concerned about alternative health care, that's an example, and you're looking for alternative cures to things, which is a legitimate thing to look for. I mean, obviously the Western science doesn't know everything and you might be interested in homeopathy or something. Well, that means that's putting you into a bucket that could lead, for example, to anti-vaxxing because there is a connection. So just like shoe buyers might be interested in handbags. Well, 
maybe people who are interested in alternative things or are, might question a Western medicine about vaccines. That could lead you through the algorithms into people who are maybe angry at the government because after all the government's promoting vaccines and there and and you know th there's a connection here and so if you think about slippery slopes the algorithm basically is feeding you what it thinks you want what it thinks you want to buy and uh, and it's and it's working in a way that's going to ultimately lead you into an extremist situation because that's sort of the natural thing of the algorithm. It wasn't designed by Facebook. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg didn't wake up one day and say, my goal is to divide the country and create a huge left-right sp split and lead to, not, you know, to January 6th. My goal is to help sell toothpaste or whatever and, and make money for my stockholders. But that's where the algorithm has led us. So uh, I don't think it's deliberate. I know it's not deliberate. I, you know, all full disclosure, I'm on Facebook safety advisory board, but I do know it's real. And I think that it's up to these companies to figure out a way that they can make their money reasonably so, but at the same time, not bring us into this divided nation or world. Well, Larry has set you up, David. Um, how do we deal with this? I mean, do we, yeah. we, we shouldn't be in the business, you know, in, in America, anybody telling people what kind of algorithms they're allowed to, to install. On the other hand, this, this whole idea of after the fact, uh, monitoring, whatever, whatever's happening, isn't working. We we completed our first poll, and uh, fully a third of, of individuals said that they had been uh, personally online harassed. Um, and and we're we're just uh, working on our our second poll, which is about making things better. But before I go into what people think, uh, David, how do we deal with this 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 issue of of algorithms and monitoring and trying not to suppress um, the you know a core tenet of our democracy, which is free speech. And, and the ability to for, for companies and individuals to to shape uh, their own activities. Yep, and, and let's be clear, Mark. Like I, I, we are big believers in freedom of speech, right? And that this is a core principle here in the United States. But freedom of speech does not equate to freedom of reach. So just because you have the right to say something doesn't mean that you should be amplified necessarily, right? Like my friend Steve Huffman, the CEO of Reddit likes to say, he says, you know what? Fringe speech is absolutely constitutional. It should be available on the internet, but it should stay on the fringe. And so the very interesting question here is, what responsibility do these enormously profitable companies have to society and to each one of us, our users, or as they like to call us, the product? Um, what, what responsibility do they have to us, the citizens, to make sure that what we see is continuing to bring our society together and is building the kind of society that we want to have? And now, you know, this is an area where, you know, in, all sorts of regulations have been enforced in the past. And, you know, we think that, you know, the, the issue here is around figuring out you know, there are, there are certain laws here that were built to essentially exempt liability from these companies way, way, way back early, back in 1995. And these laws need to be looked at carefully uh, and modified. And we need to be looking at also how do the companies in their trust and moderation teams and in their policies make some important changes because in the end, it's good for them. They don't want a toxic environment on their own platforms. You know, they don't like the bad press and the PR. Uh, and so, you know, they, that it's that in, their intention as well to work along and fix this. David, you're talking about Section 230, which is very controversial. And we could do an entire hour on that. But I just want to push back a little bit and say that Section 230 also has a very positive role in not only protecting free speech, but in enabling companies to moderate. It's almost like the Good Samaritan law that you can't be arrested because you helped somebody on the side of the road and then they, they died. So we really need to be careful before we get into that trap of backing uh, the abolition of Section 230. It's used by political extremists because uh, you know they want to get back at, at Facebook, but it actually protects. In fact, one of the be biggest beneficiaries of Section 230 has been Donald Trump. Because if it weren't for Section 230, he might have been kicked off Facebook years ago for saying things that violated their terms of service. 
Yeah, I mean, given the given the time frame here, Larry, I didn't want to get into a detailed, subtle discussion yeah, on the just Section 230 to, arguments, but, yeah. but no one here is advocating for an abolition. I think it's around looking at what are some smart ways to look in 2021 when, you know, we are well past uh, the internet in its infancy and Absolutely. looking at what are some smart ways to deal with the trade-offs here in society. Yeah. I, I think it's fairly clear that there are no simple solutions to this very complicated uh, problem. Uh, in, in the poll that we just completed, we, it was about making things better. The most important solution to combat online hate and harassment is, and we, we force people to make single choices. And it's interesting, about half the people said hold platforms legally accountable for hate speech, and about uh, a quarter each um, uh, raise awareness of the problem by talking about it with the public, in other words, educating people, and ensure the public knows about abusers and, and who, who those people are, basically out the people who are, who are uh, driving uh, hate speech and the funders and so on and so forth for, for that. It seems that there is a sense, um, at least uh, on our viewers, that part of this is driven by impact. Right. There, there are all these processes, there are all these algorithms, there are all these workflow systems, you know, uh, uh, mobile and, and all these different devices, watches and so on. Um, it's, it becomes too complicated to untangle, but there is impact. There is the 41 percent of people who actually report being personally harassed. So, so is there a way to do this that really is about uh, damage, damage to people? And, and basically holding platforms accountable when damage occurs. Because if there's no damage, there's nobody to hold to account, right? There's nothing, there's nothing wrong. But when people are damaged, when people's lives are hurt, when people are killed, are the platforms in, in any way culpable, Larry, um, for that? And is there any way to hold them into account? It's a very difficult situation because they are certainly responsible to do whatever they can. But at the end of the day, it's people. It's people. So, and I know this is not a perfect analogy, but if somebody were to use the phone to harass you, is that AT and T's fault or Verizon's fault? Um, if, if somebody calls you up and says something that really, you know, is very nasty, whose fault is that? Well, it's clearly the fault of the person making the call. And the question is, what could AT and T or Verizon have done to prevent it or to modify it? And in their case probably relatively little. So I do think that, that that platforms should be held responsible to make sure that they have terms of service and that they, to the best of their ability, enforce their terms of service. But at the end of the day, social media is social. It's you, it's me, it's the people out there, it's my neighbors, it's my political you know, adversaries, it's people in the world. And the goal of you know, a Facebook or Twitter is to bring us together and to hope that we behave in a civil way. Yes, they need to, to be responsible, but, but it's very difficult to scale personal responsibility. I mean, I understand the position that David and others take, but I also understand that at the end of the day, Mark Zuckerberg isn't the one who has been doing the harassing. He built the platform and he's responsible for how his platform is used, but it's the people who are actually doing the crimes or the, 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 the misbehavior uh, that need to be held accountable. And well, I think it's, a great, it's a great analogy because um, when, when you have uh, organizations that are using platforms, using ISPs to promote their hate, they're deplatformed. Right? There, there are people who are barred for short or long periods of, of time on social media. Right. So, you know, in, in the AT&T analogy where where somebody is using a phone to harass, well, if it's happening on, on a sustained basis, you take away their telephone. Mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a private company can do that. They can have standards that, that, that say, hey, if you're causing this kind of damage, uh, this is against our terms of service. We're a private company and we are going to take away your platform for a short or a long period of time. David, how do you see this? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, I'm a huge believer in personal responsibility and accountability. So you get no argument on me there. However, these are not phone companies. This is not a common carrier situation. Right. These companies are promoting content. They are, they are gonna be amplifying certain pieces that go viral and they are attenuating other pieces. So the issue is, number one, in terms of the editorial choices that these algorithms are making as a part of every single decision that you see that is going onto your newsfeed when you open up one of these apps. And secondly, it's about enforcement at scale. 
Every single one of these platforms have policies. Policies aren't the problem. Their policies are all reasonable. The problem is that there is an enormous deluge of harassment and hate as experienced by people who are even in our audience today who have experienced this problem. And the platforms are not doing enough to attenuate or enforce the policies, the pre-existing policies that they have already. And this, by the way, only talks about, we're only talking about in English here in the United States. As soon as we start talking about other languages and other geographies, the enforcement falls off of a cliff. So these are enormously profitable companies and it is their responsibility, not just to make the profits and minimize the costs, but to, to care and to take, take care of the users who are using their platform, all of us, and to deal with the externalities, the damage that is being done to our society because they are not doing so and they're prioritizing profits over people. This so Mark, David made the comment about you know speech versus reach and I completely agree with him. Again, I'm not c- totally defending these companies, but I also do want to point out that that is exactly what they say they try to do. I mean, I've seen, I've been on many a meeting with Twitter and Facebook where they talk about not deplatforming somebody, but basically reducing their exposure by, for example, limiting uh, the way that non-followers can see them. I agree they do not do it well enough. I agree that they have a lot more work to do, uh, but that is not outside of their, at least their, 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 what they say they're trying to do. Yeah, it's easier to criticize than resolve. And, and um, I have a lot of sympathy uh, on, on each side. I also agree that that uh, they could be doing a, a better job, yeah. um, but it is it, it is a very difficult uh, issue. We just completed another poll, and uh, David, I'll get uh, I'll get to you as well. Um, uh, we asked people um, about the consequences. Uh, tech content platforms like Facebook and Twitter can be used to advance truth or falsehood and support or harass. These platforms strengthen civil society, weaken civil society, both strengthen strengthen and weaken uh, and weaken. Um, and and we need to change. And and the overwhelming response was for the for the last uh, option that they that they're a two edged sword that they both strengthen and, and weaken society. David, go ahead. Yeah, there's no question. But here's the, what we're advocating, and I think this is an enormous uh, an enormous issue. We need more transparency from these platforms. So today, these platforms they put out these quarterly or semi-annual transparency reports where they talk about the actions that they say that they're taking. Uh, and what we need just is, you know, we would never allow a company to report its own financials in a way that, you know, just anybody can report on anything and at any time, right, that there are clear regulations about what's going on inside of a company with its profit and loss statements. We need the same kind of transparency around the actions that they take. So what actually are the policies that they have? Are there any policies that they're not stating on their websites? As the Wall Street Journal just recently talked about this last week in Facebook's cross-check program, which is all about a special set of secret rules that and a, and a whole different enforcement mechanism for over 5.6 million celebrities and politicians and others that they get treated differently. What are the enforcement actions that are actually being taken for each of those different policies in each of those different languages? And there's actually a bill right now in California called AB 587 that is actually looking at asking and enforcing that these companies need to just provide the transparency on what are those policies and what do they actually do? Because we need that data so that we can start to take informed policy decisions. If I can, Mark, if you don't mind, um, to his analogy of, of the financial world, that is absolutely true. And we do need regulations, but we also need individual judgment. I mean, you can go out and buy a really crazy stock and lose your money and the government's not going to protect you. What we at Connect Safely do is to try to educate end users, especially parents, and but also other end users. So we, for example, when the Wall Street Journal did its excellent article about Instagram harming teen girls, we followed up with an article about how you can actually use these services and protect your mental health, talking to psychologists and pediatricians. So a lot. So again, I, we can't solve all the world's problems, but what we can do is try to equip individuals with the tools that they can use to protect themselves and their children and their family. It doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem, but it's a little bit like saying, 
yeah, there are drivers speeding around and it's true, but here's how you can drive as safely as you possibly can. Um, and so that's our goal. And we certainly applaud the work that ADL does to try to prevent these kinds of harms. Uh, yeah, and Larry's absolutely right. I mean, we, and we also are focusing on how do we educate folks, you know, 40%, less than 40% of parents or guardians of young people have actually talked to their kids about how to implement safety controls or what are they playing, yeah. what, who are they playing with? So, you know, there's an educational piece that every single one of us as parents and grandparents can take to help to reduce the scope of this problem personally, but we also need to look at the societal change and we need to get involved. Superb, superb points. Thank you, thank you both. And, and we're going to do future shows on this. this. This topic is so very important and particularly when you go beyond the United States and you go into different civil societies and different standards, it gets, it gets unbelievably complicated. I think the point that you're both making is that there is accountability here, both on an individual basis, us as, usual, uh, as users and customers and, and the businesses that, that are funding these organizations, the organizations themselves, their management, their boards, and so on. We just can't outsource, nor can we demonize. And we, we have to be careful what we wish for. We're going to have a civil society, there's going to be free speech, and there's going to be abuse of free speech. Uh, Dave Sifri um, uh, of the Anti-Defamation League Center for Technology and Society, Larry Maggot, uh, President and CEO of ConnectSafely.org. Uh, Thank you so much for your support and your insights into this really complicated question, very textured discussion. We really appreciate it. Thank your boards. Thank your staffs. Thank your supporters. It's just been, it's just been great to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Have a great day.